on today's episode of Mentally Stronger. It's a story about childlike wisdom and intuition and not mistaking education for wisdom, right? So I was, uh, I was five and I came home from kindergarten one day on Long Island, public school. Parents had been in this country for maybe less than 10 years, something like that. And they noticed I had this toy and my dad was frustrated that I didn't know why I got it. And so they found out and they called me into the family room and they, um, they said, we found out why. Why are you sharing your lunch that mom makes fastidiously every morning for you? Why are you sharing that lunch with this boy? And I thought I was in trouble again. And the look on my dad's face, people, he got very emotional, which he rarely did. He's like, you think I'm mad. I'm really proud of you. You don't know that this boy's mommy died this summer. And the dad wanted to come in with a few of the siblings and just say thank you in a very discreet way. And I just remember the feeling I had in my chest. It was just, it's the best gift I've ever received. There are times in my life over the last, whatever, 45, 50 years after that, that I didn't feel as good about myself or how I was being primed. And I, I always wanted to stay true to those values. And the world sometimes doesn't make it easy for you to do that. But it's something that reminded me that to be a better me. Welcome to Mentally Stronger, the show that will help you develop the mental strength you need to reach your greatest potential, no matter what life throws your way. I'm Amy Morin, psychotherapist, mental strength trainer, and an international bestselling author of six books on mental strength. Every Monday, I introduce you to a guest whose story and expertise can inspire you to think, feel, and do your best in life. And the fun part is, we record it all from a sailboat in the Florida Keys. Now, let's dive into today's episode. Today, I have an incredible guest who just might inspire you to shuffle some of your priorities. He's got an amazing story about how a lesson he learned about kindness when he was five helped him to become an unlikely CEO who saved a women's clothing company on the brink of liquidation. Despite his impressive degrees, though, and his long, long list of accomplishments, he says he's invested in doing what really matters in life. My guest is James Ree. He's a former high school teacher and Harvard Law graduate who became a private equity investor. He now teaches at Howard University, and he's written a book called The Red Helicopter. I'm pretty sure you're going to like him just as much as I did. Some of the things he talks about today are what kindness really means, how it can transform lives, and how using a little math to invest in the right things can help you create your best life. So here's James Ree on how kindness, math, and goodwill leads to true success. James Ree, welcome to Mentally Stronger. Hi, Amy. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to having a conversation with you because I get a lot of questions in my therapy office from people about kindness, what it looks like, if you can do it these days. Uh, so I'm excited to get your take on all of that. But maybe the best place to start is, can you share the story of the red helicopter and why that became the title of your book? Sure. Um, it's a story about childlike wisdom and intuition and not mistaking education for wisdom. So I was, uh, I was five. And I came home from kindergarten one day on Long Island, public school. Parents had been in this country for maybe less than 10 years, something like that. And they noticed I had this toy and we didn't have a lot. It wasn't easy for the rehousehold in the mid 70s. Um, and they thought I had taken it from school and I said no. And then they blamed themselves because they thought maybe in America, kids give gifts to each other in Christmas and we're sorry you're never going to fit in. And then I said, no. And then they, I got in trouble because my dad was frustrated. That I didn't know why I got it. And so they found out and they called me into the family room and they, um, they said, we found out why. Why are you sharing your lunch that mom makes fastidiously every morning for you? Why are you sharing that lunch with this boy? And I thought I was in trouble again. And the look on my dad's face, people, he got very emotional, which he rarely did, actually. And my mom was watching and he's like, you think I'm mad? I'm really proud of you. You don't know that this boy's mommy died this summer. And the dad wanted to come in with 
a few of the siblings and just say thank you in a very discreet way. And I just remember the feeling I had in my chest. It was just, oh my goodness. Like I didn't, I didn't expect it. I, and I felt sad for my friend, but I felt good. It was a, this, you know, that feeling it's a, it's um anyway, it's something that I've always thought of, remembered, and it's the best gift I've ever received. Um, and it's been sort of a citadel for me. There are times in my life over the last whatever, 45, 50 years after that, that I didn't feel as good about myself or how I was being primed. And I, I always wanted to stay true to those values. And the world sometimes doesn't make it easy for you to do that. But it's something that reminded me that to be a better me, maybe. So, and everyone has one, right? It may not be a red helicopter. And that's why we didn't put the graphic of the helicopter on the cover. It's much more of a invitation to ask people, do you have one of these? And it keeps you strong during times when you get tested. I think so too. And reminds us of what's really important in life. And there were several stories in your book that were lessons that like, I think a lot of people know, or we've heard before, but you put them in a slightly different way that really made them ring true. And I want to get to those in a bit, but can we talk first then about how that life lesson translated to, to your business life? You step in to this clothing line, Ashley Stewart, it's about to liquidate, go under, you become the unlikely CEO. And basically this business is on fire. And rather than saying we need to double down, work harder, do all of these things, you step in and talk about kindness, right? Yeah, I did. <laughs> it was in the first town hall. And so for your your listeners, like I'm I'm a dude and I have an I'm Asian. And the business was for fashionable women who are predominantly black and plus size and yeah, like then the business was on fire. And this is from a private equity guy who was about to liquidate. And so the whole world was crashing down on it. And yeah, I didn't know what else to say. I, it was part of a speech where I said, I'm the only one who showed up. I'm sorry. You know, and I know I'm like the last thing you need, but I cared enough to come. You remind me of my mom. And then I said, I don't know what's going to happen, but maybe if we can be kind and mathematically truthful, maybe we can figure out a way to salvage this company and keep the jobs and the important role it plays in the community. It was not a scripted comment. It came fittingly from a very intuitive place, right? It was just a very human place. And I think I write in my book that I knew that we were all going to be stripped naked, like chaos. And it's the heat of a frying pan where you see everyone's character. You really start seeing things. And I just, that's why, I, in retrospect, that's why I said it. I remember saying it and saying it with my inside voice, what? <laughs> like, you just say kindness in like a, and, you know, a lot of the room kind of snickered and, and a lot of the room didn't though. And so I, it, the book sort of takes me on a course of understanding the true meaning of what it means to be kind. And I realized that I had to unlearn a lot of things that I've learned from pop culture and go back, back in time. Right. I think a lot of people would say we don't have time for kindness or kindness doesn't really have a place in business. You have to be cutthroat. You uh, mm -hmm. have to make tough business decisions. So what did that actually look like saying, let's create this culture of kindness? Well, I think, First of all, from a definitional standpoint, it's like we are all primed to think it's, you know, random and it's nice and it's saccharine. And then it's gotten uh, overly unsecularized, right, that it's only in a place of worship. And then there are other people who have sort of equated it to just for women, right, that it's really men can't be kind. There's a lot mm -hmm. of bad primes that have been happening. And but when you peel it all back, uh, you know, without getting too wonky about it, you know, kindness was philosophically the underpinnings of what Rousseau and Adam Smith were debating in the 18th century when they were talking about what it means to have agency. A like human beings want agency. And so when you read all of that, I mean, to me, kindness is about helping someone or making an investment in someone to help them discover their true agency. 
and you're not asking for something in return. There's no quote return. It's not transactional, but it is an investment in a person and it's an investment in confidence in a system that you are bettering a system. You're creating a positive externality for the world, right? Um, that to me is what kindness is. And if you frame it that way, kindness is relentless, actually. It's very strong. And there's a reason why, biblically, right? Love, kindness, it's you have a superpower. Like you can't be stopped. And so I write in the book, it's like water. It's just relentless. And so that's to me what kindness is first. And then when you think about it that way from a business perspective and let alone a life perspective, I think most of the best quote businesses that I've come across as an investor have been businesses that solve a problem for people, you know, and that they create value for people. It doesn't skim. It's not a margin business where you're just uh, like, which is a lot of the financial industry right? You're yeah. just taking points. You're actually creating, which is a big word, you're creating true value, a positive externality for people. I think great businesses and leaders are kind. In terms of translating that, because somebody might say, but if let's say an employee calls in late three days in a row, is it kind to then say, oh, no problem. We'll, we'll let you no. do that. Or where does, where well, does it, what does it look like to be kind? Yeah, I think a lot of this is, um, I'll tell you just from a practical standpoint, how I implement it. It's very direct. The goals are set very clear. We talk about agency and we define it. We define kindness and saying, this is what the rules are. And if you create negative externalities for others, that's not acceptable, right? There's a lot of grace and kindness. It's not a trigger, a trigger system where you make one mistake and you're out, but the, the feedback is direct, it's fluid, it's always, because with kindness, it creates and inspires and requires also group trust, right? That there's, you're doing things together and that you don't want to let down the team. And this is from a kindness perspective, practically, we've all felt it, I think, many of us. And the best way I can describe it, it's like your best coach or teacher growing up that you just didn't want to disappoint them. I hear that a lot when kind leaders are kind. People say, I didn't want to disappoint you. Yeah. When a kind leader always says, no, I don't want you to disappoint yourself. Right. That's generally the language recognition I see in these patterns. It's like, I didn't want to disappoint that person. I didn't want to disappoint other people. And the response is always, no, we just don't want you just don't want you to disappoint yourself. You're better than that. And so in an employment environment, why can't we have that dialogue? I certainly do. And then there's a point, this isn't, you know, there's if if it's repeated behavior and over and over again, and you take and you offer grace. And you know, I tend to think also kind leaders tend to blame themselves or the system first. It's like, okay, Amy, you're not doing great right now in this role or this situation, what can we do to remedy it? Is it us? Maybe you want to shift the role or is there anything else going on? And you, you sort of open the door. Maybe Amy's having a bad six months, right? There's a stretch of things and it opens up the conversation in this way that it gives permission for people to be honest. And so that's what kindness and math do. Like I, I just try to find the truth. That's my goal in life as a human, as an investor. I just want to discover the truth. And I would imagine that happens a lot easier when we create a culture of kindness. People dare acknowledge their mistakes. They're not afraid I'm going to be severely punished because I just messed up. But if I can own up to this mistake I just made and I predict I'm going to be treated with kindness, I would think it would become easier to then say, how do I recover from the mistake? Or you can all work together on solving a problem that exists rather than pretending it's not there or people being afraid to bring it up. Totally. I mean, like, look, <laughs> there's also a lot of humor with kindness. We, it's And tears, by the way, because there's a lot of that too. But the humor, it's funny. If you think about the most, when I look back, the most important thing I did in August of 2013 was show up in this chaos, right? It was bad enough that 
I ultimately hired a police officer to protect the employees. It's, it was that tense. And you have this guy come in and say, um, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm wearing pleated khakis. I got this Asian face. There's not a fashionable gene in my, in my whole body. I'm the least qualified person to run this company. And I laugh. I tend to laugh at myself a lot. <laughs> like it's just, there's no pretense, right? It's like, I know what I'm not. And when I look back, I think that was one of the most important things I did because I gave permission for everyone to just laugh at themselves a little bit, right? And just to, you know, open the door and say, look, I'm not trying to pretend like I'm somebody that I'm not. And in doing that, it opened the door and not everyone sort of went into the door, but the people that really went into the door, they tended to be women. They tended to be the black women on the front lines. They received that really well. And they just said, you know, for the first time, we have someone who's pretending to, he's not pretending to be someone he's not. And they were very generous with me. And there were many reasons why you can imagine I could have been rejected. Yeah. Many reasons. And that's why I named the book Red Helicopter, because the feeling I had in my chest when I went from community to community and the way in which these predominantly Black women received me, it felt great. Like they really liked James. It wasn't credentials or things I had done. It was more about a state of being. They liked me. And it had been a long time since I had met friends. You know, as you get older, it's harder to do that, right? Right. And a group of friends, the unlikeliest friends for me on the face of it, that they, they were very generous with me. And that's why I remember the red helicopter story during those times. I just said, it's been a long time since I felt this way. Let's pause for a second right here while I share some special offers from our sponsors. Want a fun way to improve your relationship? Try an app called Paired. Paired is a great way to turn technology into a tool that helps you grow together. You and your partner download the app and then pair together every day. Paired gives you questions, quizzes, and games to play together. You get a quiz or a question to answer, and you can't see your partner's answer until you answer for yourself. It's a fun way to deepen your relationship. Popular quizzes include things like emotional intelligence and gender roles at home. Whether you're just a few dates in or you've been together a long time, it's time to lighten the mood and have fun with your partner by using Paired. Head to Paired.com slash stronger to get a seven-day free trial and 25% off if you sign up for a subscription. Just head to P-A-I-R-E-D dot com slash stronger to sign up today. Connect with your partner every day using Paired. A happier relationship starts here. Brainstorm. What's something that works so well that it's basically magic? Air conditioning, noise canceling headphones, meeting free Fridays. What about selling with Shopify? <coughs> Shopify is a global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the did we just hit a million dollars stage, Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash mentally stronger, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash mentally stronger now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash mentally stronger. Okay, we're back. And I would imagine for the people there, they, again, become much more motivated to work for somebody who they feel like is relatable and kind. Yeah. I used to run a parenting group, and a lot of the parents, they had kids with behavior problems. And the more that their kids acted up, the more authoritarian they became, thinking I have to get control of this kid. And one of the exercises we used to do is write down, think about the worst supervisor you ever worked for write down some of their qualities and then 
people would do that. And then you flip the paper over and you think about who was the best supervisor you ever had and what were those qualities? And then we talk, well, which supervisor were you more motivated to work for? And it often went back to what you said earlier that somebody would say, well, when I had this amazing supervisor, I wanted to show up and praise was important to me. And I wanted to make sure I was doing a good job and I wanted to feel good about the work I was doing. Mm -hmm. When I had the awful supervisor, it became more about I was going to hide my mistakes or I was going to pretend just to get through the day. I was there for my paycheck. I didn't care about anything else. So this seems to be a shining example of just that. Once you show up and you make it clear, hey, I'm not Mr. Know-it-all. I'm not here because mm -hmm. I... I, I'm going to rule with an iron fist. Here's what's going on. And then it works pretty quickly. You transform this entire company and everything changes. Yeah, it was, uh, I think early on, they, they knew I said, I'm not staying. Like this isn't, I'm going to stay as long as I need to, to try to make sure that this isn't a situation that it's successful for you. That was the other big thing. It was just like, this is, I'm not, this isn't a fiefdom. Like I'm coming here. I, during those seven years doing this, it's been four years since I've been there. I mean, the, I, I really was as close to, I was about, I was a, as good a form of myself than I have been in my 50 something years. It was, I was so clear about what was necessary. I wanted her to win. I really just wanted these women that had, I wanted them to win. And looking back now, and as you know, my the, my tenure ended um, six months became seven years, which was I was away from my family too much too. But my mom died at the very end, very quickly, and um, I really put two and two together while writing this book. You know, I just I wanted my mom to win too. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And so, like, she was someone who always wanted me to be better or take the credit, have the spotlight. And when I look back, there's still not a single person I've met who's a better embodiment of leadership than my mother. And the closest that I found were a lot of the women that befriended me during my seven years at Ashley Stewart. For our listeners, I think very few of them are ever going to step into that role where they have to save a company that's about to liquidate. But maybe we can talk about kindness and how it translates to to our personal lives too, because you make yeah. that distinction that there isn't a work life and then a personal life. You're the same person regardless of Good and whether bad. you're <laughs> at work or at home. You're still you. Yeah. And yeah. and I think a lot of people though are working against that, right? When they'll talk about work life balance. Are you at work or are you at home? But you make a very clear case for saying you're still the same person in both places. Yeah, I don't and sadly I don't think we have much of a choice right now given how some of the powers that be in technology has infused our whole lives. We are geographically and like spiritually, like we're working, it's all the time for most of us. You're on your device, phone, you can't escape. Right. You, just, you can't. And so I think that's one of the reasons why people are struggling at home. You know, I think I write in the book, I'm like, how good do you feel when you're writing a book about kindness or reading your child a book about kindness or something? And it's on a laptop that your employer issued and they're tracking your keystrokes. And so I think that's the dissonance that we are all feeling. Yeah. And yeah. I, I don't want to have many Jameses. I have, it's just me. It's too complicated as it is. So I just want to be a really good, as good a version of me as I can and show up in that way in every community or every situation that I'm in. And I think that's, the first thing I spent a lot of time teaching this in classrooms now too. It's just what's the one person and try to get that person in as good a place as you can. And a lot of the younger people these days and all of us, we have five different personalities and five different social platforms, right? There's, you know, that little meme that says, here's the LinkedIn, you, the Instagram, you, and yeah, I think that's really, that's too much particularly for younger people, but for all of us. And so that's the first thing that I try to do is just to sort of just be that person. And I think the other thing that's been helpful to me is, um, you know, I really have grown to take myself less seriously. I take other people very seriously, like in my relationship with them. But like for me, <laughs> I'm like, 
okay. And I think part of that is because um, the last 10 years I've been through a lot and I've lost both parents um, like too, too soon. And in a lot of ways, I walked away from my identity 10 years ago. Right. So there was a death of that identity. And, and I learned to have grace for myself. You know, it really, that was the big thing that I didn't need these credentials got heavy and like all of these things. And sadly, I, I really have appreciated even more the value of relationships, just having lost both my parents. Like I miss them a lot. You know, right. I wish they were here to read the book. So that's, that's my big advice is just, uh, and I get it. Not everyone on the podcast listening is the CEO or like, and you have to sometimes work with some pretty toxic people and, I guess what I would say is um, I hear you and I hope that your toxic bosses read the book. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Number one. Number two is that maybe um, you probably deserve better than that. And maybe there's a better place to be and work and to find people like that. They're more than you think. I've talked to many of them over the course of my journey. And I think the last thing is just to remember that you are the CEO of your own life even though I may not feel like that at times. That's. I love all of that. A couple of questions that I'll often have people ask or things that I see get raised about kindness. I'd love to get your take on them. One would be sometimes people say, I don't even know what exactly what kindness looks like. And there's dissension in the ranks sometimes. If uh, people give food and money to homeless people. One person says that's kind. Somebody else says that's enabling and it's a really unkind thing to do. So I see people get stuck in this idea of saying, well, I actually don't even know what the kind thing to do is these days. Yeah. um, So I'm not a big fan of the YouTube sensationalized kindness videos. Okay. With the one-time gesture of um, generosity and like you set up a camera and like, oh, I'm giving you a hundred dollars. And I don't think that that is kindness. I think that, um, and even like those spot cameras that are not, that are unscripted where you see someone doing something like walking someone across the street, stopping traffic. Those are really nice things to do. Those are very pro-social considerate things to do. I think kindness is, which is one of the reasons why we're talking about it. It's so hard to see. It's longitudinal. It's long. It's a steady investment in someone, in a relationship, good and bad, right? It's really kind people are very direct. And I've had friends who get mad at me when I say things they don't want to hear. But I'm like, I'm just saying, I don't, you know, and so it's not sexy. It doesn't usually involve an, an object. I think the real kind thing that was happening when I was five, the red helicopter was the friendship. The, The sandwich was just, a small physical manifestation of it, you can't see it. And so I think in the book, I write about not just coaches, but particularly teachers, but like, you know, that story about Adele, you know, with Mm -hmm. that one teacher that poured into her and then she lost touch with the teacher. And then one day they got reunited like many years later and said, you changed the entire course of my life. It takes a long time. So that video of Adele Think about it. It took whatever, 15, 20 years for kindness to be to be made manifest. Um, I think the other thing I tend to bring up too, because sometimes kindness and I write about that goodwill is sort of the result of a serious acts of kindness, is the end of the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. That's a we see it that during the George Bailey is, you know, he's not some saint. He's running a savings and loan. He has to keep a business afloat. He gets really mad when he has to make tough decisions that sacrifices his honeymoon. He screams at his uncle Billy, right? And he he's really torn. Kindness isn't some treat at times. It really does take, it's an investment. And at the very end, what you see when all of the people come, that's goodwill. That's the result. And that literally there, goodwill was money. People came and gave him money. And the person um, who sort of made him see everything was Mary, right? She made it tangible. And so that's what I think the book is trying to do is to make 
an intangible thing, more tangible, but it took me 350 pages. There's no shortcut. Like it's, um, and I'm trying to encourage people to sort of appreciate that in their life. It's a longitudinal journey. There's so many things that it just takes a long time to see your quote balance sheet at the end of, at the end of a life. And I know that my parents really did gift me at the end of it. What, what I saw my dad, who sometimes thought he was not as successful as he could have been. And I think my dad was incredibly successful when I saw what happened at his wake. If I have a wake that's even 5% of what I saw, I will be a successful man. Oh, I love that. And I felt the same way at, at my mother's. She was a, she'd worked at the post office and we had lines of people that told us stories that I had never heard before about the kindness that my mother had shown them over the years. And I thought, wow, that, that's real success. That's amazing to, to hear those things. And I love that distinction that kindness isn't just that one-off donating to a charity, doing something that in the moment to, to help a stranger necessarily, that uh, it's about building those relationships. But what about the person who says, if I'm kind to that friend uh, or that person that I work with or the neighbor on my street, I think after a while I'll get taken advantage of. Yeah, kindness is not, what did I write in the book? It's not self like eviscerating. It's not, kind people are very strong. I mean, it's very intentional. And, you know, like there is a concept in the Korean language that I put in the book called like nunchi and chung. Like these are, what I think kind people do is like, so you make an intentional investment, you see how people behave. So this is why game theorists actually do like simulations on kind people. Kind people tend to win over the long term in the game theory. Um, but you watch people. Kind people don't suffer fools either. Right? Right. If you see people taking advantage of you and not reciprocating or using your kindness and mistaking it for weakness, then you have to make a recalibration and saying, okay, I, I see how you behave. You mistake my kindness for weakness and it's not. And then you make a decision and say, oh, I'm going to spend less time with you. You don't have to say that. <laughs> you don't have to confront and have a fight about it. It's not like you're saying, I did this. Why aren't you doing this to me or for me? But it's more just, a, okay, I got it. You know, and you, um, you know, the way I write it in the book is that you, it's like a Marie Kondo of your balance sheet. You clean up your relationships a bit and you say, okay, I got it. I want to be with people who reward my kindness and they want to invest back into the relationship. And I just want to live my life surrounded by those type of people. And how do you make sure that, you, that you're giving that you're kind, but at the same time, you don't want to be taken advantage of, but also there should be some reciprocity if you're the only one giving um, after a while, you're going to feel feel like you're taken advantage of. But you also don't want to do something kind just with the expectation of, and then I'm going to get this back twofold. Yeah, I think the the entire book is like a big celebration of public school education, right? Like I'm very worried. I'm a public school kid and I'm really worried about our country's unwillingness, inability to invest in the public school system. <laughs> like no good things will happen there. And Again, I, I think it's like, you know, I, in my acknowledgments, I write about my kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Griffith, who was awesome. You know? Yeah, you just, it's, you, you make, like an investor, like, so putting my private equity hat on, not every investment you make as an investor is a good investment. You have to make mistakes. Right? So like, just like, so investments in relationships, you're going to make mistakes. I mean, you're going to, invest time and energy and love into someone that doesn't reciprocate and oh well right that's what what are you gonna do and so like i've i think the other thing i've gotten better at in my old age is that i used to think oh when i had a failed investment like that that i would sort of say i would say hey or i'd get mad or disappointed but now i don't i'm like okay it's okay it's okay. I, I will take action. I will decide that I will spend less time with this person. I don't have to announce it. 
right? And say, you're a bad right. friend. I will, I will have agency about my decisions and my time. And then, you know, if they want to come back later, five years from now, 10 years from now, which as you know, that happens, right? People right. rediscover you. The door is open. Why slam door shut? I, I was, I did that more in my twenties. I just, I learned better in my forties. Let's pause for a second right here while I share some special offers from our sponsors. I used to think the key to staying hydrated was to drink more water, but drinking plain water actually won't meet all your hydration needs. You need electrolytes too. An electrolyte imbalance causes headaches, fatigue, cramps, brain fog, and weakness. I know this because I learned it the hard way. So I started drinking Element. It's a sugar-free electrolyte drink mix that doesn't have artificial colors or sketchy ingredients. My personal favorite is the watermelon salt. Getting my electrolytes back in balance cured my brain fog and I have a lot more energy. Element is great for anyone who wants to restore their health through hydration. If you want to see how much better Element can make you feel, try it risk-free. Order it for yourself. I think that you'll love it, but if you don't, just let them know and they'll give you your money back, no questions asked. And right now, members of the Mentally Stronger community can receive a free Element sample pack with any order, so you can try all the flavors for yourself. Just go to drinkelement.com slash stronger to claim your free sample pack. That's drinklmnt.com slash stronger. Okay, we're back. And first off, I love that you mentioned your acknowledgments because I read the acknowledgement section of your book, like, mm. like, a, like it was a full chapter. It was just a wonderful section of your book that I hope people don't skip when they read it. Sometimes the people's acknowledgements are just a list of names or I'd like to thank everybody who's helped me along the way. Yours was really heartfelt, the part about your teacher and, and all the other things that you say, like you can tell that you really do value those relationships. And I hear you talking about investment too. So the subtitle of your book is lead change with kindness plus a little math. And <laughs> you teach us a lot about, about the math and how sometimes we think it only boils down to the, the dollar sign. And you teach us about investing into other things and then the reward at the end or the, uh, the payoff isn't always monetary. One of the stories that really stood out is, is you talk about the loss of your parents and how all of us someday may have to go through our parents' belongings. And the things that become the most valuable to you in those moments probably have very little monetary value, but they're meaningful to us. And how those sorts of things become of such value. But in our lives, we often think it's the bank account that matters. And that's where the, the money, the most important things are, have to do with money. But you put this in a very clear way that shows it really doesn't at the end. It really doesn't. I mean, I, I was there for both of them and there is nothing. I remember the hospice nurses saying to me, I literally moved in with my mother, right? I mean, that was, and, and with my dad, but it's, um, She's just that there's so many people at the end of life in hospice, you have these muckety mucks saying, do you know who I am? I want a better bed. I want more. And the hospice nurses who are like saints, right? They say, um, it doesn't matter. I'm sorry. Like everyone gets the same treatment. We're all going to the same, same place. And there's just silence. And I, I spoke a lot with the hospice nurses and saying, wow, like that's, and they just said, we hear it all the time. And so, yeah, like it's, I, you know, it's, uh, this is not in the book, but one of the things as I was clearing out my mom's st stuff, which was like right as COVID was bearing down, mm. it was heart wrenching because she had saved like matchbooks from the restaurant that we went to after Jennifer, my sister's ballet recital. All these little things, she saved them. And she knew I would know. She knew. And they were all neatly organized. So like, you know, every, we're looking at all the furniture and stuff and I'm in the drawers and saying, oh my goodness, Jennifer, this is, we went to Carvel after you got a good report card when you were like seven. This is the napkin. Yeah. 
And it was really painful and, but beautiful. And it was sort of just another conversation with my mom, basically. And I'm like, you knew I would know. And in Korean, that's, that's, it's actually called chung. That's the, these objects, they start having a separate life. There's a, there's a relationship in an object or, and those things I save, like I have, look, this is, yeah, you read the book. So I'm going to show you this. Boom. This is my mom's Phyllis glass that she, oh. this is the one thing with her, you know, I don't know, kind of, you know, not common American name that she chose. And like, she saved this for a reason, Phyllis, because I'm sure it reminded her funny and sad uh, that maybe she, this wasn't the right name for her or something like, and so it was in a corner in her bedroom and I, I saved it. So yeah, yeah. you know, it's these things, I mean, like you die, you die. And what I'm trying to do is, you know, in the dedication to the book, you know, is for my parents, but at the very end, I ended with really my children and my parents. And I would like for my children to understand the meaning of this Phyllis class. Cause it's just part of who they are. Right. <laughs> Another powerful way I think that you drive this point home is you talk about the lemonade stand and how nobody comes to the lemonade stand for the quality of the lemonade. Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> like, lemonade sucks. <laughs> so why do why do people come to a certain lemonade stand? Yeah, it's just, that's the example of the neighborhood small business. I spend a lot of time with neighborhood and small business owners and entrepreneurs because they're accountable to their to their community. You can't survive as a small business without your community, right? And so we've gotten away from that in this country. Uh, look what's happening in the UK. They're really learning what that means when you don't have social compact with financial compact, right? We have faceless money now. So the lemonade stand is something everyone knows. Everyone will laugh the same way. The product sucks. It's disgusting. Because the kid's fingers are in the cup. There's grass in it, right? It's disgusting. <laughs> but you buy it. And you're giving them real money, but you know that what's being exchanged is something else, right? You're basically saying, good job, kids. It's good for our neighborhood. I know your parents. I coached you in soccer or whatever it is. It holds communities together, just these little things like this. And intuitively, we know a better business does do that. A better business does create that sense of social compact. And I think underneath, maybe not that far underneath, there are a couple pages where I go off a little bit on a rabbit hole, but I'm, I am worried about our society, right? Just as a, as a civics person and also as a capitalist, it's very, it's very alarming to me how divergent those two goals have become. And um, it's count, it, they're like they're working against each other right now. And I hope that this story and like, I think that the story of Ashley Stewart, just because it's so seemingly implausible right? from a gender race, we, we didn't have any money to pull off what we pulled off. Maybe it's, I think people are hearing it better now because they are desiring it, right? There's a hole in people's lives. They're like, we missed that. It is good. Intuitively, we know it's good. How do we get back there? And I hope that this story just gives people permission and one proof of concept and saying, we didn't change the world. Like this was not like we didn't cure cancer, but I think we did some pretty good things. And when you do those things, the ripple effects, they're still spreading. Like me, every time I'm on Howard University's campus as the chair of entrepreneurship there, I get a really reclaimed feeling in my chest. I'm just what a, it's just humbling. It's like, thank you so much for inviting me here. And I don't know, those things I think tend to last a long time. Kindness does translate into goodwill. Goodwill is a, it, it is a very necessary asset and you can't quantify it all the time. I guess that brings me to my last question for you. And I'm curious to, to know at this point, how would you define success for you? Mm.
this is this is the next chapter of my existence i think i think where i am so i just turned 53 um and i think for me right now red helicopter you know it's not just a book right it's a philosophy it's a curriculum it's a brand it's a it's just a way of being uh, a way of being hopefully that's infused with philosophy and money and things like this that will help people have agency and what i'm trying to do for the next 30 years of my life because i'm living the next 30 years from 53 to 83 i want to live it the way i lived from 22 to 52 so 20 at 22 i well, i wasn't capable of doing anything right i was but i was terrible at everything and then by the time i was 52 i'm like oh like i'm pretty good at a few of these things i met a lot of awesome people so i want to live the next 30 years like i'm 22 meet new people, try new things, new foods, new countries, new ideas, and be terrible at things. And maybe I'll be better at it when I'm 82. Um, but I think this 30 years, my real focus is the way I started my life when I was 22. I taught high school. I made $12,000 a year teaching high school. I think I am a teacher, like at heart. And I really, it bothers me when people feel they're small. I don't like seeing it. I just, I'm like, no, I don't think you're small. <laughs> Come on. You're, you got these things going for you. I'm like, I, I got gotcha. you. Like you're good, but you got to want it. So that's what red helicopter is. I hope that after 30 years, it will, it'll help people find their agency during a generation that I think is going to have a harder go of it than we did when you have sort of a lot of public systems that are failing. It's requiring, I think, too much entrepreneurship and risk at too early an age right now. And mm -hmm. so I want to provide a safety net and like an uncle type personality brand that understands that and says, you don't have to be a grown up at 22 or 18 or 16. And I'm trying to, that's what, that's for me, what, what will be success that maybe when I keel over at some age, um, hopefully, you know, many years from now, you know, again, if I could have five to 10% of the funeral slash wake that my parents had, that'd be pretty awesome. And from what you said about your mother, if, if my friend's, and random people also, not friends, just acquaintances, come up to my kids and say, hey, your dad, he was a pretty good dude. Right. Like, that would be awesome. That's where I am in my life mentally. I love it. And well spoken from somebody that has lots of degrees. You could be doing so many different things on the planet. And to say that that's your definition of success, I think that's uh, refreshing to hear and a great reminder to the rest of us about what really matters. I'm just so appreciative that you wrote Red Helicopter. I loved it. And I hope our audience all goes and picks up a copy of it to read it for themselves. Thanks, Amy. It was fun. It was a really good conversation. I really appreciate you having me. Well, we appreciate talking to you. James Ree, thanks for being on Mentally Stronger. Thank you. Welcome to The Therapist Take. It's the part of the show where I'm going to break down some of my favorite strategies James shared and talk about how you can apply them to your life today. Here are three of my favorite ideas that he talked about. Number one, differentiate between being kind and being nice. James explains how being kind doesn't mean that you have to tolerate bad behavior or let people treat you poorly. Sometimes the kindest thing you can do is say no to somebody or set a boundary or even reduce your contact with somebody. His book goes into a lot more detail about what real kindness looks like. And it's more than just waving to your neighbor in the morning. It involves doing kind acts and showing compassion to the people around you. And of course, I love the story of the red helicopter and how he helped his friend who didn't have lunch to eat. I can only imagine what it was like for that kid who had just lost his mom to have a buddy who helped him out at school. Instead of saying, hey, sorry you don't have lunch today, he shared his lunch with him out of true kindness. It's true what they say. You never know what somebody is going through. 
and you have no idea how much a kind little act might make a lifelong impact on somebody. And number two, focus on forming deeper relationships. I appreciate that James isn't a fan of the social media videos that show someone handing a $100 bill to somebody in need because those one-off things, they might seem nice, but they aren't actually about forming deep relationships that actually change somebody's life. James makes it clear that relationships are what matter the most in life and showing people kindness is a great way to deepen a relationship. And number three, Figure out your definition of success. James shared his definition of success, and it had nothing to do with how much money he earns or how many degrees he has. He just wants people to remember him fondly when he's gone. When you know what your definition of success is, you get clarity over your values and your priorities become easier to juggle. Decisions become easier too, and your life gets better because you know what's important. Take some time to think about what your definition of success is. So those are three of James's ideas that you can apply to your life today. Differentiate being kind from being nice. Focus on forming deep relationships that involve kindness and create a clear definition of success. To hear more of his incredible stories and wonderful tips, please pick up a copy of his book, Red Helicopter. I can't say enough good things about it. Thank you for hanging out with me today and for listening to the Mentally Stronger podcast. If you like the show, please leave us a review on Apple or Spotify. It's one of the best ways to help us get the show in front of other people so we can make the world a stronger place. And if you want more tips on building mental strength, subscribe to Mentally Stronger Premium. Sign up at mentallystronger.supercast.com or just click on the link in the show notes. If you know somebody who could benefit from learning more about mental strength, share this show with them. Simply sharing a link to this episode could help someone feel better and grow stronger. And as always, a big thank you to my show's producer, who says his favorite childhood toy was actually a basketball, Nick Valentine. <laughs>